This is our, our second panel discussion in this La Leona project, which is um, dedicated to uh, women and guitar. And on my panel, we have um, composers and guitarists who've been working in this project um, and collaborating. And um, we're supported by the PRS Foundation and by our wonderful artistic director, Tom Kirstens, who fully appreciates the need to have some push behind uh, and support for women in the arts. And uh, IGF has had a very long history of commissioning works from composers, and it's a really important aspect of its work since 1993. Uh, and another important aspect has been the support of young guitarists. So the La Leona Project um, brings together both of those really important uh, parts of IGF's work, but uh, acknowledges also that um, further work needs to be done to bring women uh, at a more equal uh, level in our commissioning list. So uh, we had, in July, we had some premieres uh, at the Guitar Summit, and um, over these past few days, we've had uh, more premieres, and we're very lucky to have uh, this afternoon a concert at 3.30, and um, I hope you can all join us, and we'll hear some more of the great works that have come through this collaboration. Um, I've got uh, Electra Perivalaris, uh, composer at the end, Shannon Latoya, Simon, guitarist, Kathleen Koltai, who will be, they'll both be playing this afternoon's concert, guitarist, uh, Elena Kelly, who did uh, the premiere of the Florence Anna Maunders uh, piece in July at the Guitar Summit, so she may well speak a little bit about that, which would be good. And then we have Sarah Leanne Lewis, uh, whose piece was premiered yesterday, um, composer, and uh, uh, you're not seeing double that we have. First is Effie uh, Effimu, and uh, then Lither Effimu. So Lither's uh, piece was the set piece for the semi-final of the London International Guitar Competition, and they both have a long connection with uh, the uh, IGF Foundation, uh, and that's one of the things that we're very proud about the IGF is that once um, someone comes on board um, in some project we maintain contact and support and concerts and repeat performances are really important. Um, I don't want to talk too much more so I think I'd really like uh, each person really to talk about what made them decide to become either a composer or a guitarist and I thought we might start with Electra. Electra um, has just had uh, her piece for the BBC Concert Orchestra broadcast on Friday on Radio 3, which is a wonderful piece called um, Forest Reawakened. And uh, so, w I mean, we're really happy to have um, some really <laughs> leading young composers and as well as young composers. Uh, Sarah has just been in Marseille for a week in Composer in Residence. And um, she was working with the orchestra. They have a lot of um, accordion players, so she was doing that. So perhaps she'll talk about that as well. And um, I think one of the really important things about our panel discussion today is that um, it's an opportunity for us as well to talk about and compare the guitarist-composer collaborations in this project, because each one has been working with a particular guitarist, with a little bit of background support from Tom. And um, so, and each one will have a different experience of things. So I stopped talking that lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Therese. So um, my route into composition was actually through the piano. So I, I was a pianist from a, a really young age, played a lot of different instruments um, and sang in my school choir and um, just felt a, a need, I suppose, to, to try writing some of my own music. And I attended um, lots of free workshops from, from the age of 12 run by the, the BBC Young Composer Scheme. So these were workshops open to absolutely anyone who had an interest in composing. 
Um, and, and at the age of 16, I wrote my first piece. So that was a piece for my school choir, a female voice choir. And um, I submitted that for a workshop run by the BBC Young Composers Scheme. It was a workshop uh, to hear choral, your choral piece performed by the BBC singers. Um, and my piece was selected. So I, I had the opportunity to, to go to that workshop, which was led by Judith Weir and to hear my piece come to life um, with this in incredible uh, choir. And it was at that point, really, that I began to see composition as, as something that I could do, as something that women before me had done, um, and, and as, as, you know, this thing that I could, I could build my, my whole life around, really. So it was a, a, a defining uh, moment for me, I think. Um, so I guess my kind of love for music came from um, growing up at home. I've got a quite big family and um, we have a lot of Caribbean culture and Caribbean culture is all about carnivals and music and dancing and these are things that you know I had when I was growing up um, and really influenced me to become a musician. Um, the guitar I actually wanted to play the electric guitar and um, I begged my dad for lessons and he was like, okay, he gave in and he said, okay, I'm going to get you lessons. And when I went into my first lesson, um, the teacher handed me a classical guitar um, and I didn't want to play it at all, but um, <laughs> I stuck with it. My dad said, if you stick with it, then, you know, we'll swap you over to electric guitar in a month or two. Um, he never did. <laughs> and so here I am still playing the classical guitar. Um, but I think the influence for me to keep going with that came from my high school, um, which was an all-girls school, but it was also a specialist music college, um, which meant that we had music in all of our lessons. Um, most of my tutors were female, and they really pushed us to be um, excellent within our fields, um, especially within music. So I think that's kind of what brought me to being a classical guitarist today. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I think um, my, my interest into music started by just listening to concerts and theater. My parents are music lovers and they, they were bringing me and my brother to theater and music events a lot. And then I kind of hook, got hooked on that and wanted to become a musician from a very early age, like three or four years old. Um, and then the choice of instrument was by accident, um, or that was the possibility I, I got to play at music school. And from a very early age, I, I was really interested in contemporary music. Um, so by the age of like 15, I, I was kind of collaborating already with, with composers, young composers around me, and this, this, this went on. I, I, um, from that early age, I also started to create my own arrangements and uh, and um, ended up inventing a new kind of guitar, uh, which we'll maybe mm -hmm. talk later. And um, yeah, that, that's my route. Uh, my route is um, kind of through the electric guitar, a bit like Shannon. Um, my granddad used to play in a lot of bands in Liverpool, um, so he used to teach me a lot of Beatles tunes on his electric guitar. Um, so I did that when I was quite young and then um, kind of went off it, it wasn't really cool, I didn't think it was cool anymore. Um, and then I started piano lessons um, and then when I was a bit older I went to, um, to college and did some A-levels. Um, I thought it'd be nice to take up the guitar again but I realised everyone was playing classical so I thought, uh oh, better try and um, learn some classical guitar pieces. Um, and then I just kind of fell in love with it from there and um, went to university and um, we had a module in our first year on uh, women composers and I thought, wow, oh my gosh, I've, I've never played a piece by a woman composer, that's terrible. Uh, and that kind of really sparked my interest in um, discovering works for guitar by women composers. Um, so. I probably got into music making just, I was part of um, a very active amateur music making family. Um, so 
growing up, I didn't realise at the time that it's not normal to sing extracts of Handel's Messiah at Christmas time <laughs> for the whole family. It's not normal. Um, but that was kind of a tradition that we did and was just sort of celebrated. Um, admittedly, some of us were better than others. Um, but um, as that was sort of part of my childhood and I learnt piano from a young age as well, uh, taught by my great aunt. And I just, it, out of all the subjects at school, it was always music that I wanted to do more of at home. Um, and I was part of orchestras. I was a very bad violinist, um, always second, like second violins were right at the back by the horns. <laughs> um, and I just remember being in a county youth orchestra and we were playing Sibelius V and just sitting there and thinking, this is what I want to do. Like, I want to be like being able to create music and just sit in the midst of it. And so that was kind of the start of me realizing this is definitely the pathway for me. Um, and then it was through my music teacher when I was going through my A-levels at school, I was sort of writing down um, little kind of tunes and things. And obviously as part of our GCSE and A-levels, we would have to do parts um, composition. And then my teacher encouraged me to um, submit a piece that I'd written for string quartet for a, a local um, West Wales based competition called um, The Young Composer of Dovid. And it was basically an opportunity for young people, um, I think from the age of 12 to 21, to work with professional musicians um, some of them were uh, musicians who worked with the Welsh National Opera or the BBC National Orchestra of Wales. And we would workshop our pieces and they would be performed in a concert, which as a teenager is an incredible experience here, hearing something you've written, never expecting to hear it by a professional orchestra, uh, by a professional ensemble, it's fantastic. And that was sort of that light bulb moment of, this is it, I wanna write and work with musicians and, and create kind of sounds and experiences for others. So it sort of went from there, really. Um, yeah, so um, like everybody else, I think I've had lots of nice, positive, formative musical experiences. But actually, I think, I, I, don't, I don't think there was any one thing that made me think I, I want to be a composer, because actually, you know, in the 80s, I mean, I didn't... I didn't think the job composer existed, and I didn't think it, what, of what I knew of it, women didn't really have a role in that profession. But I think as you, as you grow older and the more you compose, the more you work in the industry, and the more sort of successes you have, the more you just want to stay in. So, um, you know, working with organisations like IGF, also I've had some very inspiring teachers. I'm, I'm, I'm also a teacher at King's and I also take lessons from the great George Benjamin who is just a fantastic inspiration and makes you want to keep learning all the time. Um, and I think it's just all those positive experiences as well as the formative ones that, want, that sort of make you stay in the profession. We work together, my sister and I, as collaborative composers in multimedia projects. We've done lots of work here at King's Place. Our model is slightly different to, um, well, it's... It's commission based, but it's also, um, there's a different angle to it. And it's, our model is about fundraising, getting the funds to create large multimedia projects, which we, which we collaborate on with other musicians, but also dancers and actors and filmmakers. And it's all these other things that keep you, keep your foot in and interested in, in the profession. I think that's it. Yes, well, um, uh, uh, yeah, we're sisters, so probably not much more to add to that. Um, <laughs> but just, yeah, what got us interested? Well, yeah, as, as, as everybody said, yeah, the um, uh, in, influence of our um, excellent teachers um, from when we were younger, and yes, and also all of the um, great experiences um, that we have working with fantastic musicians and at fantastic venues like, like this one um, um, in, our, in our sort of later years. Um, that, that, has, that has really kind of kept us going. And, and really the thing is, um, yeah, as everybody said, um, the being inspired to create what we consider to be beautiful and meaningful sounds um, and, 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 and collaborating with fantastic people. That's really 
it, I think. <laughs> so during this La Leona project was established during the lockdown. So um, we've had to do a lot online. And one of the um, important things is the, the actual meetings between the composers and the performers. So there's, they've had to do a lot of Zoom meetings. And as you know, the sound quality is not super. But um, one of the benefits um, from uh, the organi organizer's point of view is that those collaborations we've recorded. Um, so now we have an archive of the discussion between the guitarist and the composer. And sometimes there have been two meetings or three meetings. Uh, and that we f find is really important because when later people come and they're going to be looking at the score, they can actually sort of um, log in and, and listen to the discussion that went back behind the creation of the piece or decisions in fingerings or positions um, and, and what the composer wanted. Um, and also the what contribution the guitarist made to that collaboration. So we're really lucky. Electra's piece this is going to be premiered this afternoon by Catalin. Um, and I hope you've all got programs. There are programs outside. And so you'll see the concert for this afternoon is on page 20. And uh, Electra, would you like to talk about your piece a little bit? Of course, yes. So my piece is called Waves Caress the Skin of an Ancient Rock. And it's influenced by the coastal landscape of my home. So, so I'm from an island, a Scottish island called Arran. I don't know if any of you have been there. It's off the west coast of Scotland. And um, the landscape around my home influences m most of my music, the ecology, the changes in the natural world, and, and the way that humans uh, interact with the natural landscape. So the piece this afternoon um, is focused around the, the coastline at the south of the island. So it's a, it's a very ancient coastline, volcanic. Um, and there are these lines of, of rock formations. We call them uh, igneous dikes. They're black volcanic rock, um, which cooled um, as, as this, this lava um, hit, the, hit the cooler rock. If, if there are any geologists here, I'm sure you, they're kind of screaming in their seats <laughs> with my description, but <laughs> that's the best way that I can describe it. And the piece um, depicts uh, the form of one of these rocks morphing and shifting and evolving over millennia with the movement of the waves. And I was interested in capturing this kind of sense of ancient time in a short piece of music because I think that music has this power to suspend time. You know, we can experience thousands of years in five minutes um, and we can experience, you know, a moment in a piece that lasts for an hour. So, I, so I'm exploring that in this piece. And the guitar was the perfect instrument, actually, to, to create this kind of sense of form and texture evolving. Um, and it's, yes, it's been a wonderful opportunity to, to have to, to explore these things which are important to me. And Catalin, so would you like to say something about the working with the composers? Um, like, I suppose why the reason I most like to work with work on contemporary music is is this opportunity to actually work with composers because I believe a notated score gives us just a very small fragment of the real information about the piece and. Uh, and of course, we can um, go for historical background when the composer is not there anymore or not approachable. But but this is so different when when we can really discuss and find out um, what the composer meant there. Um, and I think in in this case, um, so Electra's piece is is really strongly focusing on texture and. Uh, um, and texture ha has, so a, a very important part of texture is timbre and, um, and also um, different w ways of expressing resonances. And these, these features are not 
we can't see them in the score because notation doesn't give us information about timbre or just very basic information like soup, ponticello or metallic or this kind of timbre, but still we can't really find out uh, without, no, without consulting a composer. So I think what we mainly worked with Electra was, was these kind of differences between timbres and different kind of touch between uh, parts, which are actually, if, if, if one looks at, at the score, are quite similar, the patterns are quite similar, but, but, uh, but I try to express them in, in many different ways as, as the transformation of the texture of the rock happens. And did you find that you could actually um, add to the score for future people to, to understand a lot more? Were, were there things that were added uh, through after the collaboration or, I mean... Well, I think it's more the composer to ask this question. Yes, uh, I think, you know, naturally this process is different from performer to performer and it's been really nice to work with Catalin and I feel that we've, we've developed a, a very personal approach to the piece. So I think, you know, that would change were I to work with someone else on the piece. Mm -hmm. um, the way that they perceive it and the way that they perform it would be, would be very different. And I wouldn't want to be too prescriptive mm -hmm. in the score because, you know, one character which, which comes perhaps very naturally to Catalina in certain sections of the piece mm -hmm. um, might, might not to another performer. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Sarah, you had your uh, piece premiered this week, also by um, Emmanuel Addis. And um, so, was that your first guitar piece that you've done? Yeah, um, I've never written for guitar before. I don't really play the instrument myself either as a pianist. Um, it, it's, it's a totally different instrument, isn't it? And um, even as a string player, there's that notion of, okay, there's strings, there's kind of positions where you can get chords, but just the, I, I, I worked with basically, um, I borrowed my husband's guitar and would kind of figure out, okay, is, th is this workable in terms of the hand span? Um, and I've got really small hand spots, so that never helps. Um, but I always worked with this kind of um, <coughs> fretboard in front of me that I would constantly be referring to, just <coughs> making sure that it was actually playable. Because I think when you're working with um, an instrument you don't know, there's that fear of, um, writing something that's not just, um, it's, it's not well written for that instrument and doesn't use it in the way that it, it, it can really um, work well. I mean, it is complex to write for the guitar. Mm. Um, and Lisa, um, on the end, she actually wrote the, the piece for the semi final, and she is a guitarist. But maybe you could talk about, I mean, uh, non guitarists composers might feel that you're at an advantage but I'm not sure you would agree with that. Yeah that's a good yeah that's an interesting observation because I think um, to some to some degree I probably am at an advantage because I, di I, I didn't have the need to have my fretboard there because I knew what could yeah. be done but I think to some degree I'm also at a disadvantage because I feel um, I have an intimate knowledge of the guitar uh, and such an intimate knowledge compared to uh, the knowledge I have of other instruments which is um, you know, learnt. It's, uh, it's not in my fingers, it's not in my bones, it's not in my history, um, or, or certainly it's not in my history from a, a young a child, and, and I'm not immersed in that instrument. Um, so often writing for, the, well, writing for the guitar for me is a very difficult thing because of this um, intimate knowledge. I feel, I, I just, I, it, there's a lot of pressure, there's um, a sense that um, I can't sort of, I, I, I often feel that you know, I, I must comply. I must comply um, with all the rules that I know about the guitar, and there's often a fear of extending beyond that. Um, but yeah, this commission was interesting because unlike the last commission and unlike the um, collaborations that we've just heard about, I didn't have a guitarist to collaborate with. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I wrote, as you say, for the um, for the uh, heat for the competition heat. And so my remit was, I think, I think this was my remit, I don't know if Tom's here, <laughs> to, write, to write something that the guitarists could learn in good time, because they only had a couple of weeks to, 
play the piece and they had to play it um, as part of their competition program so it needed to be something that they could get under the fingers really quickly something that wasn't going to sort of challenge them too much and give them too much of an, an you know a crazy task uh, before their competition performance so I sort of you know, decided on a short, simple, familiar sounding work so that they can display, so that I didn't give them too much grief, basically. <laughs> and, 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 and I was probably the best person for that because I know the instrument really well. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so if you, can we ask you to comment on that also in, in, from the same point of view? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I do. I mean, I don't have much more to add. It is an interesting question because, yeah, in one respect, it does make your life easier to write for an instrument you know about, but actually then you fall into the trap of being somehow being derivative or doing things that have been done before and, and not being innovative. And, and a bit, but, but the guitar is, a, is, you know, it's difficult for the guitar as well because... I mean, the IGF are doing a fantastic job of trying to get composers who aren't guitarists to write for the instrument. And composers who are writing for the concert hall, for, you know, who are big international stars to, to write for this instrument. And that is absolutely the right thing to do. Because otherwise, new music for the guitar will, will stay in its small remit. And that is really what we don't want. We want all these people who aren't guitarists or or and guitarists, but who are fundamentally before they're guitarists, who are good composers, who, who are composing not only for the guitar, who are composing in a much wider remit. And, and I think, what does that bring? It brings innovation, it extends, it extends the music that we have, it takes the repertoire to a different place, it for sure won't be derivative. And you know what? You need somebody who doesn't know the instrument to... To, to challenge the listener, to create something that we haven't heard before. And, yeah, so I think it's important, and it certainly doesn't put you at an advantage knowing the guitar. In fact, maybe it, do, it can cripple you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Eleanor um, did the premiere of Florence <coughs> Anna Maunder's piece um, in July, and Florence is one of those super talented <laughs> people who... Um, has to try and decide where she's going to focus on because she plays several different instruments. She plays uh, classical, non-classical. She composes and and um, she's got a huge network of contacts. So people are always asking her. So, she, but she's really trying to sort of um, limit her zone of concentration. Um, and so, can you just talk about what it was like to try and uh, working with her on that piece? Yeah. Um, so the piece was called Finding the Way. Um, I'm kind of similar to her, well, within her, like, um, compositional voice, it was like, she drew on a lot of influences from, like, um, different, different kind of music from um, Turkey, jazz music, classical music, so there's a real mix of everything. And um, so then trying to notate some of these things, like, similar to what Castellan said, like, a lot of it is, is not on the score, what, what she imagines is, is not strictly written down, so um, a big feature of her, this piece was um, was rhythm um, and a lot of the stuff that she'd written was um, just kind of to fit into the bars really because the idea was to be more like improvised um, and so when we had the conversations on Zoom um, we were able to really like delve into what, what she really imagined uh, as opposed to what she was limited to write on the score um, so yeah so that was really interesting um, to to discover like her influences and also to um, to kind of use my knowledge as a guitarist to try to work out um, how I could best convey that like to work with her to really bring out what she imagined that the sound would be like um, yeah so it was a I always remember she said it was like a real collaborative thing like it was it was both of our pieces in a way which was mm. really nice so. yeah that, because that's a fantastic yeah. uh, response isn't it mm -hmm. now Shannon you've got um, a, a new piece that you it's not actually part of the Lali on it but it is by a woman and it's, it's very um, fresh hot off the press isn't it so uh, we're going to hear that this afternoon do you want to talk a little bit about that yeah, sure. So I'll be playing um, kind of excerpts from a larger work by a composer called Amelia Clarkson. Um, she's somebody who I actually studied with a few years ago, and the piece is called She Lingers, 
and it's about um, Sarah Everard, who was sadly killed um, by a police officer earlier this year. Um, and it's about females' reactions to that and um, kind of how we felt when we were living around South London. And, and um, the first movement is called uh, In the Ground, and it's, it's a meditation, basically, a kind of mourning. Um, the second movement is called In the Flowers, and it's quite simple and quite chorale-like, um, and that's kind of reminiscent of Sarah. And the last movement is called In the Air, and it's very kind of agitated, um, quite sharp, quite kind of angsty, um, but it ends with a sense of hope, which is something that you know all women feel that there is you know a sense of hope at the end of the day. So, yeah, mm, that's great. Electra, um, this is actually your second piece for the guitar, um, but do you feel, um, are you feeling that you might naturally compose for the guitar again? As, does it, is it a voice, is it now a voice for you? I think so, definitely. You know, I feel that the way that I've approached the guitar has evolved over the, the two commissions that I've written, and I love working with the instrument. I think there are so many possibilities for a composer. Um, I love the choreography of the guitar. Maybe that's a strange thing to say, mm. but it really seems to me, you know, like when you watch a, gu a guitarist performing, there's a choreography, there's a beauty in the movement and the changing of positions and, and the way that it works um, with, with the, hand, the hand movement. And, and um, I think that's something I'd like to explore more in future future pieces that I write. And also to work with the guitar, I think, with, with other instruments, because I think there are, there are um, more, I, maybe I'm wrong with this, but I, I think that there are more solo guitar pieces than there are, you know, perhaps duos, trios. Mm -hmm. uh, because the guitar is a very quiet instrument, mm -hmm. it can be hard to strike the right balance um, with, with other instruments. But that's something I would like to try as well. Great. Sarah, you're, you've heard your piece now in concert, which, um, did, did that change how you felt about things, about the writing, or...? Um, I think it's always difficult as a composer, hearing your piece for the first time in a concert, it's mm -hmm. kind of, even if um, others around you may think, oh, that, that, that's really interesting, you always sort of spot the bits like, oh, I could have done better there. Um, but I think rather than me thinking what I could have done with the piece. I think it's the whole process of writing it for me was really enjoyable. Just discovering um, how my sound world, which is ordinarily uh, quite concert hall, um, kind of orchestral based at the moment, works on a very quiet, very intimate um, instrument. It's, it's an instrument that just really draws you into that sound world. It's got a very very quiet, very mesmerizing feel to it. And working with that um, in contrast to the other music I've been writing at the moment was just mm. hugely, hugely enjoyable and one that I would really, really happily go back to. Mm. Mm. Um, Lisa, would you, I know that you and if you both love writing for strings, um, but uh, if you, when, if and when you were writing, for the classical guitar. What are things that you feel you can say on a classical guitar that possibly you can't say elsewhere? I think the, 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 the difference between a classical guitar and another string instrument, obviously we all know the difference, but the, the fundamental difference with the classical guitar is that you have a decaying string, don't you? So the, 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 it's strongest when it's struck at, 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 at the moment it is struck and then there's this beauty of the decay that happens after and um, I mean I've got nothing sort of <laughs> profound to say about that but there's that is part of the beauty of the guitar that cannot be emulated on another st string instrument on a bowed string I know you, and of course you can the bowed string you can play pizzicato and there's a sense of that but the, it, it, it isn't quite the same I don't mm. think there's a resonance on the guitar string and a longer decay that is part of its beauty mm. and um, 
there's, there, there, there is in the hands of a great composer, <laughs> and there, there have been many great composers, and there are lots here too. Um, there is a, a you know a, a beauty that can be uh, that can be kind of composed with that knowledge. Um, yeah, and I and I'd also um, echo um, Electra, and I'd say that yeah, the gestural quality of the guitar is also um, is also unique and. Um, also has beauty that can be exploited, that cannot be exploited in, in the same way, at least, in a bowed string. Um, mm -hmm. So I'd say, yeah, it has kind of unique qualities that, um, that can really be brought out. Yeah, uh, I would add to that that, you know, I've just, I've just actually finished a string quartet for, for um, um, uh, the London Chamber Ensemble. Uh, Madeline Mitchell was playing her first violin, and she is fantastic, and I loved uh, that project and then after that project I had an orchestral project and then I had the um, La Leone guitar project and what I would say is that writing for the string quartet and the orchestra um, you know e everything you wanted to say um, could be said because it was very easy you had uh, four instrumentalists in the quartet you have a whole orchestra any voice leading that you want to happen any any big structural um, component that you really wanted to, to make happen could happen, it's much more difficult on the guitar because you're, you're, you're limited in ways that you, you wouldn't be with multiple instruments trying to create your, your harmonies and your voice leading. But that, that, that need to be economical, because obviously the guitar is a harmonic instrument but, but only has obviously one player, that need to be economical and where, where to place your lines, how to map how to have multiple lines of music occurring at one period of time but with only one instrumentalist and, and making it all make sense so for the line to traverse the texture, not just to be a bass line and, a, and a, an upper line, but for it to, for it to be in the texture like a, good, like a good counterpoint. That's very difficult, but actually when you've achieved it, it's so special on the guitar and which notes to leave out of the line because your fingers need to stop playing the bass line now because it's, like you say, impossible to do, technically impossible. How to make those decisions and the outcome of your decisions actually can create something very special for the guitar. Um, so, yeah, it, it feels like it's a limitation, but actually it makes you think so much harder about which are the important notes. Because you don't have an orchestra, you don't have a string quartet, you know. Um, yeah, and, and, and even not like the piano, because a lot more is possible at one given moment, even on the piano. You know, so it does make you like that economy of ideas. You really need to stick to it. And, and they're always the best compositions, you know. Um, so my teacher, again, George Benjamin, he writes, his, his music's been compared to like, you know, a chocolate box. It's very delicate and every decision is the right decision. And I think that's what we should all be striving for. And, and when I write for the guitar, that's definitely what I strive for. So. Fantastic. Now, um, Kathleen uh, um, has uh, been working hard to expand the possibilities of the guitar, um, and she's actually created her own guitar, which, um, I, would you like to talk a little bit about it? Do we call it the Ligeti guitar? Yeah. And yeah. I think we're hearing it this afternoon in the concert, Yeah. Uh, because um, an Irish composer, um, Grandia Mulvey, has written a piece for it. And um, so that might be another um, challenging instrument for um, you La Leona composers to write for, but it really changes the fundamental re resonances that are open. So I think probably composers, non-guitarist composers, or even guitarist composers will go a bit mad trying to um, rein in the bitties. But can you tell us a bit? Um, yes, and I also brought it. Oh, you brought it? Okay, English. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. so much easier to explain. It is, <laughs> yes, if people can see it. it. So, so the guitar has a transformed fretboard which, which has um, embedded the steel plates which you won't see but it is therefore magnetic and I then invented these small capos which, which are able to hold notes 
by having a neodymium magnet inside them. So I can just put these capos wherever I want them really and then have completely ra radical open string set by that which I can, as you see, I can change very fast to another one and obviously these notes won't be playable as I would need three, you know, two, two left hands for these because they are so far from each other. So that's, that's the main, main idea. Um, and it just happened through creating arrangements of my own and, and have, ha have had this vision of, of if I would have something to hold that note, I would play these other notes in the meantime there, and then I did just happen at some yeah. point. <laughs> Which, of course, Effie, that, um, then you've got the issue of some of the, you still have to refine your ideas. Yeah. However, there are solutions. Yeah, um, yeah. So sure. depending on how many players adopt this, um, is yeah. it complex? Is it, I mean, is it complex like, Scordatura, changing the tuning of a string. You mean like men mentally? Like, is it yes. exhausting to play that instrument? Uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't say it's exhausting, but it is challenging. I, I'm kind of still understanding how. I mean, what's the best way to to create all these scordaturas? Mm -hmm. uh, just maybe one word about the name, the Ligeti Guitar. It yes, is, it, it is. It's paying an honor to the Hungarian composer Gyurgy Ligeti because um, he composed the piano cycle entitled Musica Ricercata and it is based on different pitch sets and my idea was to translate the pitch sets to open string sets to this design. So actually this piece was the main ins inspiration for me to create this de design, the wish that I wanted to play it, so and that, that's why the name. Yes, I do. Yes, yes. So that's great. Thank um, you. Ella, the teacher want to say anything? In particular, um, Shannon. <coughs> no. Does anyone else want to comment? Because otherwise, I'll open the questions up to the floor. Shall I, Electra? I'm happy to. Open okay. Up. So now, we, if um, I think we might have a roving microphone, possibly Marcel. Or John could shout when he asks his question. <laughs> okay, Jane. If you can hear me, I'm just wondering uh, okay. if, um, if this kind of project is quite unique or if you, if you've all participated in something similar um, with other organisations or um, meaning the this women kind of team or the Lariona. Um, I, I've been collaborating another project uh, uh, with uh, with a contemporary Irish contemporary music center. Um, we last year we we had a project um, on Saint Bridget's Day, and we we uh, they commissioned uh, women composers and and um, there were several world premieres on the day. Um, Kind of celebrating women creativity as yeah. St. Bridget's Day links to that. Um. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, w well, with quite a few different organisations, but not for the classical guitar. I have to say, this is the only scheme um, that I'm aware of where um, a classical guitarist is partnered with a with a composer. Um, but I mean. Is, I suppose it. So I'm working with Zaffa at the moment. They're an ensemble in a contemporary music group in Manchester, and um, yeah, we're going through a similar process. Um, but I'd say it's it's it's. Um, I'd say for the classical guitar, I mean, it's arguably more important because um, because it's not an orchestral instrument, and generally speaking, well, depending on what your experiences are, but generally speaking, I would say. Um, a university composition department doesn't usually cover the classical guitar in terms of um, how to write for it as, as a composer unless you unless there's an invited guest or something um so 
this is quite a special instrument, um, so therefore this kind of thing is, is required, in, I think. Um, but yeah, these sorts of collaborations, I think probably lots of people on the panel have collaborated in this way with musicians. Sarah, do you want to talk a little bit about your trip to Marseille? Um, yeah, I can do. Um, so, I mean, I had gone to Marseille, um, I came back last week, um, and I was one of three Welsh composers um, who were commissioned by a French ensemble um, called Ensemble Telemac. Um, it's based in Marseille, and um, it's, a, it's a sort of collective of musicians. And for that particular project, there were eight of them in the ensemble. Um, and it was made up of a flautist, clarinetist, uh, trumpeter, percussion, piano, accordion, violin, and double, um, cello and double bass, so there's nine. Um, and part of it is, is this nature of collaboration as uh, composers and performers, that the idea is we go over to France and we presented our work in a week-long project. We went into libraries and did work um, presenting our pieces um, in a sort of commented concert to the public. And then we had uh, the more formal concerts and we went into the conservatoire in Marseille and presented our pieces to the students and sort of talked about how, um, how we wrote them and the, the ideas behind um, the origin of the pieces as well. And the idea is then that next year the ensemble will come over to the UK and tour our pieces and hopefully some music by French composers as well um, in the UK. So there's that real sort of dialogue between the two countries, which I think mm -hmm. is, is, is brilliant in music to have that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, th I think um, that was one of the things that we were talking about yesterday, that it's really important that, um, that music is not only just created and performed, but that, that it you know, you communicate the process with people. Mm. And that's what's really good about the lectures. And, and uh, that's why we're really happy to be here today, to just discuss and share the experience. Because um, it, it, it is, music is created as a form of communication. And so you want to really share the whole aspect of it. Um, now, do you think um, you could, you would be defined, be able to define um, the possibilities of your Ligeti guitar to a composer? I just have to ask you that. I know I'm supposed to let the floor. How would you, I mean, what do you, what do you do to explain to them what possibilities they have? Well, um, I, I, I st no, normally start with saying something very big, so saying that, well, from now on, this, this is all possible because you know ah, there is okay. no no limited span. So unless so, if you are expecting that you can't write two notes on one string at the same mm -hmm. time, otherwise um, any distance is possible in in a polyphonic way mm -hmm. on the instrument. And then, of course, I have to explain. But if you want to change the 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 set. Mm -hmm. Then either I need a fermata, or I need to play open strings where I can change by the left okay. hand, um, or a small pose or something like. I I, I I often compare it to the harp pedal because oh, okay. actually that makes it easier. Yeah, it, yeah, because actually it, it it requires the same time to change, like it's around two one two seconds to change. Mm -hmm. um, so. Actually, I, I, I did an interesting experiment this summer. I was playing in a chamber music um, as an ensemble version of Debussy's Palace and Melisande, and I was the harp. And, um, <laughs> and I was copying the harp pedals with this system. Oh, and of course, good. the range is different because the harp is so much wider range. But, mm. but actually, the, the texture re result, it was, I would say it was quite close to the original, which is, you know, really interesting. Really so, interesting, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm making this, compar trying to compare it to other instruments, like the harp, also a little bit to the piano pedal, which is, you, you know, you play mm -hmm. a note with this, and then you, you can hold sustain it by it. having yeah. sustain it. So, yeah, mm -hmm. like, like that. Mm -hmm. um, I'd better go back to the floor. Uh, John, would you like to ask a question? <laughs> um, 
I come back to um, a point that uh, Effie touched on earlier um, about uh, the dangers of knowing about the, the guitar as a composer. Uh, just thinking about uh, the parallels with the with with, with uh, keyboard music. Who are the great keyboard composers of all time? Bach, Couperin, Scarlatti, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, Schubert, Schumann, etc. Et Chopin, Liszt. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the list goes on. Okay. <coughs> keyboard players, everyone, M many of them really fine virtuoso keyboard players. So why is it uh, not a, an impediment to writing good keyboard music, to know something about playing with, with the keyboard, and why is it an impediment to writing good guitar music to know something about the guitar? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think most of the um, most of the composers you named, maybe did you name Chopin apart from maybe Chopin, um, were also um, I think before they were keyboard players. I, I I would argue that they were four foremostly composers who wrote for a, bro a broad range of just any ensemble that they could write for. And I think their true craft was in composition, but maybe maybe they arrived there through the keyboard, but it's true that they were also fantastic keyboard players. Maybe there's something, uh, but, I mean, I think it is very, very fundamental that they did also write for a plethora of um, ensembles. W and when I think of classical guitar composers, and I, I wouldn't name any of us, in the, I, I mean, uh, when I think of classical guitar composers, maybe I think of you know, Leo Brower, who was obviously, it was not an impediment for him to write fantastic music, being a, a, a phenomenal player himself. But maybe what I'm thinking is that the, um, the experience of the, the, the archetypal classical guitar composer who is also a performer, their experience writing in other, um, for other instruments is, is arguably limited, you know, it's not, I mean, I don't know about any Leo Brower piano concertos or, um, I mean, I say Leo Brower, but I don't know. I, 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 think, I think their experience in the, wider, in the wider remit of orchestral and just concert music is, is, is limited. I mean, it is. So I think maybe, maybe that's what I'm trying to say. We need composers who, um, who, yes, can or can't play the guitar, but first and foremost... We need composers who are working in a very big world, not just on the classical guitar. Do, is that clear? Does that, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a good point. But, but I, I, I wonder also whether this whole question is, is, is tinged with a kind of snobbery that dates back to Segovia in the first place, because his, his idea was that he was going to... Uh, bring the guitar up from, from its lowly origins and make it in, into a serious concert instrument. And he was going to play serious music on it. He wanted to play all the great composers, which he arranged himself, if you know. Um, and uh, and he, uh, he made a big effort to get music from non-guitarists. Um, for the sort of reason that you're saying, there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. Julian Brim have the same kind of idea. Uh, but I, I wonder whether times have changed now, because in those days, um, there wasn't a great tradition of, um, of, of real all-round musicians who were guitarists. Mm. Uh, there was Fernan Fernando Shaw that had mm. some general success in writing other kinds of music, in, including mm. a ballet that was very popular. So on. Uh, but uh, generally, it was true that uh, guitarists tended tended to write very slight music, and they didn't know how to write anything else. Mm. But now, I don't know that it's really necessarily true. You've got you, you you've got a vast number of of, uh, of guitar specialists coming out of music colleges and universities, and there's no reason why 
they shouldn't be as, 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 as uh, well versed in writing all kinds of music as anyone, anyone else in those places, is there? No, I think you're right. I mean, I, I'm, I'm one of those. You know, I, I went in as a guitar specialist, and I, um, and now I, and I know I'm, a, I'm a composer, and and that just, yeah. I mean, you're right. I, 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 I write a, as a composer in the real world for lots of. I mean, the guitar projects that I've done are much smaller compared to the other projects that I've done. You know, they they come very seldomly compared to um, orchestral write, writing or string writing. I, I, I mostly do, but. Um, yeah, the world is changing, and there are um, many more um, guitar specialists who are first and foremost composers. And yeah, I suppose you are right um, that that hasn't always been the case. Um, I, what what yeah, I will say is, I think there's a case of mistaken identity here. I actually think I was the one that said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I think I was the one that said, and because I have an intimate knowledge of the guitar, I find it. I think I made a similar. Oh, right. yeah. yeah, a similar. Yeah. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. Yeah. I just want to like you're trying to defend an, uh, an answer that you didn't give. No, but I mean I the sentiment is is true. Like I think I. I never get you two mixed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, yeah, I wonder also if there's something in the keyboard that is um, more transferable to to writing more broad, like uh, composition more broadly. You know, part writing is all under the finger, so every composer always knows how to play the piano because it's just so much easier to conceptualise harmony and voice leading in particular, like where how all of your voices are converging to make this texture, to make this piece, how your motions of counterpoint are, are working. Because it's visual as well. It's visual and there's more fingers. There's something about the keyboard that facilitates your composition more easily. And maybe that aren't partly answers like why are all these fantastic composers in, in history or um, pianists and, and, and that didn't limit them on the piano, but yes, it didn't. But crucially, it also didn't limit them anywhere else. Like, um, does that make any sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Electra, do you mind saying something? I, I, can I, when um, Cataline and um, Electra got together on their Zoom meeting, um, Cataline's very instinctive. She's got a lot of experience. She herself is a keyboard player. Um, but I've, I've watched her collaborate with a number of composers now and she looks at the score and then she sort of she feels things so she looked at the score and said to Electra did you write this on the piano are you a pianist and that really um, but she doesn't say that to everybody so do, do you want to comment on that the whole thing about the keyboard and then transferring onto the guitar I think for me I, I was a pianist um, and still am and, and, you know, my, my undergraduate degree was joint composition and piano performance at conservatoire. So, you know, I had this, uh, I was practicing, you know, many hours a day, the piano and, and so on. So my process um, as a pianist and a composer evolved together. And it wasn't, you know, it just happened naturally. It was, it's very difficult to talk about because, it, you know, it, it just was completely instinctive and, and natural for me. Mm -hmm. um, I, I always work at the piano. It's just just the way I compose. I'm not playing necessarily the keyboard, mm -hmm. but I sit there to write, um, not necessarily playing, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which uh, is very very different, I guess, from from composer to composer. And mm -hmm. many composers work digitally now. Mm -hmm. That's not something I could ever do. Um, but, um, I mean, when I'm writing for, for other instruments which aren't the piano, I don't consider it to be any, any limitation. I think actually being a performer, whether you're a guitarist, a pianist, being someone who has performed, you know, it makes you aware of the physicality that's involved in mm -hmm. performance as you compose for mm -hmm. other instruments, and that can only be helpful, mm -hmm. um, helpful for a composer. Sarah, you did say you had the little... Um keyboard, um, a fingerboard for the guitar, yeah. but when you were composing, were you composing at an instrument? No, um, at the time of writing, I'd literally packed up my entire house because we were going, um, we were having major building renovations. 
So we literally had one guitar available and that was it, and the fretboard that I had. Um, I had no access to a piano or any of my normal ways of composing, so it was quite limiting for me at the time. Um, but it did help to have that visual visualization of the instrument I was writing for, rather than relying on my piano knowledge, which I knew wouldn't transfer directly to the instrument. Yeah. Yes, left here. And I think what the Electra and Sarah says, they said just now, is mostly what one finds in composers, the keyboard and second rescue, the, the fretboard. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm a player, so I have worked with composers, not females necessarily. Uh, and one finds that the better they know the instrument, and not the guitars necessarily, but the more they have worked on it, in a, in a physical way, uh, maybe passing through this keyboard and so on. And, and, and fact, so that is the best possible collaboration because, well, John mentioned the clavis, we have the same uh, um, cello and violin. The better you know an instrument, the better you can write. And so the, the better you can express yourself and the better sort of uh, the collaboration in the sense can be. Although it is fantastic that so many Yes, because there are two ways of knowing an instrument, aren't there? There's the um, the way that we all have, to, we, you know, there's the study of the instrument from um, an internal, embodied, somatic um, way. We are we are immersed in playing our instrument. We have a physical, bodily connection to it. And there's the other way. Um, and if you write for lots of instruments you're also engaged in this way and that is the study of the instrument and the collaboration mm -hmm. and both um, both are good both provide you with the necessary tools with which to compose for the instrument and um, and one gives you that intimate knowledge um, through your you know through the body through the muscles and the other gives you an intimate knowledge you know through the brain mm -hmm. and through kind of observation um, but yeah, for sure, as you say, um, the more you know the instrument, mm -hmm. the, you know, the better the result. Mm -hmm. And it is easy for the player to see what it was written on the piano and, and yeah. in the guitar. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or whatever, or he, the string player that is, you know, he grew up with the violin and then he composes. You can see it very easily. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Can I, Shannon, would you talk a little bit? <laughs> Uh, because you're very aware of your relationship with your instrument, aren't you? It's yeah. something that you, you you talk about. Not everyone does. And um, is that um, when you're doing the collaboration, do you discuss that with the composers also? Um, yeah, I think I do. And I think it's, it's really important. It, it kind of brings us back to why new music for the guitar is so important and why it's really important to have these connections with the composers and these conversations because you're coming up with work that actually does work for the performer and it's something that I talk a lot about with the composers that I work with. Um, I like a lot of space, I like a lot of resonance um, because I find that physically these are the things that work best for me, these are the ways that I can perform best. Um, and I think from a starting point um, I always talk about how I feel when I'm performing it. It's not looking at the notes or, you know, kind of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. It's For me, it's more about the feeling and it's more about how I can convey these things um, when performing. Um, so, yeah, I think. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, more questions? Jane. One, uh, perhaps a slightly lighter question. I'm just a bit curious about how you all adapted to kind of working more online and using Zoom for collaboration, but also um, perhaps Eleanor could um, tell me a bit about how it is to perform um, online, because that must be quite a different experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, so like in terms of performance, um, you kind of rely a lot on well, it's nice, obviously, to have a live audience to kind of engage with other people and mm -hmm. to kind of sense how the room feels and everything like that. And of course, you just don't get that online at all, just in front of a camera. 
after you play a piece and you feel like if it's been like a really intense piece or something at the end and you just hear like the bin men outside or something instead. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's difficult. And the one thing, I mean, if we've recorded concerts online, like uh, we've all done, um, you always think like, oh, I can get it better in one more take, one more take. And, and then three hours later, you're still on the same piece. So it's just, uh, it, it kind of ruins the, um, the experience of just having like that one moment, the one chance to perform and like, and sharing that with the audience. So it's, I mean, do, do you think it's here to stay though? That, um, um, yeah, well, I think there's, there, there are pros to it, you know, people who maybe can't access concerts in person. Um, and, you, you know, you can watch and connect with people all over the world at, at one time. So there are, there are pros to it, so I think possibly yeah. maybe some elements will stay, yeah. um, which is not, you know, it's not always a negative thing. But for the collaboration with the composers, that must be quite a yeah, I mean, it, you know, if you live quite far from each other as well, it's so useful to be able to do that. But then, um, you know, like sound issues or whatever, connection issues, which is what I had a lot with, with Florence as well, which was a real nightmare. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's just pros and cons to, to it, really. It was useful because I was in Spain actually the time when we were um, Zooming. <laughs> um, so it would have been quite difficult to, to get pop over on flights. Um, but yeah, then we missed out on the, you know, like her having a chance to try and see how, how things work properly up close. Yeah. So. Um, I think we've run out of time, unfortunately, but I just wanted to thank you all for coming and uh, a special thank you to Tom Kirstens because he's the one that actually put in all the hard slog to get the funding from the PRS for this project. And uh, it's an ongoing project. Um, and that, that's really exciting for us because as we're going along, we're um, carving out new paths and, 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 uh, and there'll be a lot more performances. So thanks very much. I hope you can all come to the 3.30 concert today, which is um, going to have the, all the premieres with um, Shannon playing, Kathleen playing and Sergio as well, who is a wonderful young player. So uh, thank you very much to all of the panel for coming and thank you. And Good night. <laughs> <laughs>